Hello, everyone. Welcome to Move for a Movement. I have with here with me today Dana Tysoon Burgess, the founding director of Di Dana Tysoon Burgess Dance Company, Washington, D.C. based. Um, he's done work in higher education, a uh, lot of dance diplomacy work through the State Department all over the world. Generally, a lot of experience and great wisdom to share. So thank you so much for joining us today, Dana. Oh, thank you for having me. This is so nice. Yeah, of course. Of course, and just for context, everyone, we're filming on November 4th. So our minds are, tiny piece of our minds are there, but we trudge on, we do our work in the world. <laughs> right, right. Yeah. So your mission, I, I love, it's fascinating and beautiful. Um, let's see, just so I get it right here. Uh, Dana Tysoon Burgess's dance company's mission is to create and perform new dance choreographies that sensitively illuminate our multifaceted American landscape. DTSB DC's repertory focuses on identity in the context of historical events and personal stories, thereby bridging cultures and connecting shared human experiences. Mm -hmm. So I'm curious about, I wonder if you can tell us more about how that mission evolved for you in the context of, of yourself personally and the company, how that grew. Sure. Um, well, the company now is in its 28th year. We'll be celebrating our 30th anniversary um, in 2022-23. And so it's had several different evolutions because the world has changed in many ways over that period of time. But I grew up in Santa Fe, New Mexico, and I'm Korean American. I grew up in a Latinx community and went to bilingual Spanish schools. So there were always many different cultural conversations going on. And so what I found at an early age was dance allowed me to have a language which made sense to everybody and that I could express myself through. And so I think that's continued into my adulthood. It's interesting how, you know, these early experiences that we have set us up for the rest of our life. You know, it's this well that we keep drawing from. So when I moved to Washington um, to be um, a professional dancer here, I danced for lots of different companies and then decided that the sorts of roles that I was receiving in the, this is like in the late 80s, um, didn't really speak to my personal experiences, like where I was from, who I am. And so I decided to start a dance company. And the dance company originally was all Asian American and Asian dancers. And so it started out that way. And I was really interested in the Asian American diaspora in dance. And, um, I think part of it was a longing for family and feeling homesick, you know, so I created this community. But also in those days, DC's um, cultural landscape was divided between um, African-American, Caucasian and Latinx communities. And there wasn't really a voice for Asian-Americans yet. So I felt like that was something that I really wanted to tackle and to fill that void and was very successful at that, um, made lots and lots of pieces. The company grew. Um, we ended up then sort of shifting and, and what happened was I felt that the stories I was telling, like I started realizing the universality of the human experience more. And out of that universality, you know, stories about, um, love, about loss, about celebration, about death. It's like, you know, humanity has a limited number of stories in a sense, and we all share those stories because of our life experiences. So I started to diversify the company and diversify the stories and histories that were available to me and just really dove in. And um, eventually the company in the early 2000s opened the Kennedy Center dance season started doing a lot of work for State Department and just continuing to present my work. And then I was commissioned by different ballet companies um, around the world and the country. So that's how it grew. And I think that it grew really organically from 
conversations that I was having as a young choreographer and young dancer in the community and um, just learning from lots of different people, lots of different perspectives. Mm, I love that. It's interesting. I had the unit, you pointed to the universality. And one of my questions was, there's also, what from what I've seen watching your work, this specificity that does make these characters, these, these voices in these stories that you're uplifting, they're specific enough to translate, right? But there is that level of universality that makes it, oh, that I, I resonate with that story, right? That's, I know that story in myself or a loved one. So I'm wondering about in your process, if there's sort of a conscious balancing of that, is that something that evolves organically? Oh, that's a great question. Um, and thank you for feeling that way about the work too when you respond to it, that's really great. Um, I really like to research the subject matter and the stories and the, the socio-political context of a character. So a lot of my work now is around creating works that are inspired by specific portraits which reside at the National Portrait Gallery because I'm the first ever choreographer in residence for the Smithsonian now. And what's great about that is that I'm able to speak to historians, to curators, and sometimes artists themselves and personalities, um, which who might still be living, others are not, of course, because their portraits are older. But um, so I do that research and then I try and figure out, well, what from my life experience do I really understand? Because I think that a choreographer is only as successful as their understanding of the material. So I would never take on something that I didn't somehow have a personal perspective or understanding of. And that's what I'm always like looking for. And once I can figure out what that is, then um, I start to layer a story. And I, I think of it a lot like writing because I have I want to make sure that a piece of choreography has arcs, you know, <laughs> that there are um, symbols that go all the way through the piece of choreography and that there is a language which is developed enough that a uh, choreographic language, which is specific movements and gestures, which when they're repeated or manipulated, people start to be able to translate that language into emotional understanding. and then I take that language and I, I feel like I build sentences to paragraphs, to chapters, to overall, you know, whole like parts of a, almost a book. And then make sure that there's that strong beginning, middle, end that can take the audience along this journey. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, while that journey is going on, allows them to resonate on their own life. So they feel connected to it. Mm -hmm. All right. That's so fascinating, this idea. I was just thinking of a, a piece, a work of dance art as a mm -hmm. essay in movement or in dance art with all the accompanying elements of costume and lighting and all that. Yeah. And in our culture, we're not necessarily trained from a young age like we are with books or other things we read, mm -hmm. right, to, to understand that and to see that that as a certain kind of communication. Um, and that's a challenge for the dance field. I think that's what a choreographer, like you're saying, building that arc so it translates. And there's just cultural work, I think, to do to impart the, the importance of communication through the body and the centrality of the body in our lives, not just for a vessel for our head. <laughs> mm -hmm. right. Which, I mean, it's a, that, that's a conversation that go on forever with Cartesian duality and that. <laughs> right, right. Um, well, I'm a big believer that movement and dance are a fundamental universal language, right? And that mm -hmm. before we had written language, we had dances and we had dances and, and um, vocalizations and chants and drumming, you know, that somehow told our stories and that connected us to the environment, that connected us to 
transitions within our own communities and that we fundamentally acknowledge movement. So we know when someone is like depressed because they pull into themselves, right? We know when somebody's elated because they're jumping up and down. Um, so we already know that language. And so if we're given time to ruminate mm -hmm. on it again, then that is like super helpful, you know? Then I think that's how we all understand it. Yeah. I love it. Yeah, I was, I was so interested before speaking about growing up in this, this incredibly culturally diverse community, mm -hmm. Latinx, but you're also growing up in South Korean or Korean American um, right. home, right? The, you personally, your life, and how in that you found movement as a language to bridge, to, to bring all that sort of the stew of all these cultural influences around you. That was sort of a reference mm -hmm. point. It's really fascinating to me and you were right. talking about that. Oh, thanks. Um, yeah. Yeah, I think uh, it's definitely been the language that has allowed me to translate what I'm feeling on the inside and what I'm seeing on the outside in the external world. So right. I, I really love dance, you know, it's my life. <laughs> love it, it's beautiful. It's also interested, so now what you're sort of mainly interested in because you're also a choreographer in residence at the Portrait Gallery, mm -hmm. the way you choose those stories, right? Um, I imagine that there's different elements every time, right? every sort of time you choose a story to uplift, there are different aspects, but I'm wondering if there are commonalities there in how, mm. in sort of what stories interest you. You spoke to, you, yeah. you, there's not to be something there that resonates with you, um, but apart from that, mm. I'm wondering if there are other elements to the storytelling that, that draw you in. Well, I'm very interested in individuals who experienced a certain sense of displacement within their lives and mm -hmm. somehow triumphed over that displacement to move from being like the other or the outsider mm -hmm. to moving to being a central voice within a major mm -hmm. cultural conversation. And mm -hmm. so that's the kind of portrait story character that I'm looking for all the time, because I think that we've all felt like outsiders at some point in our lives. And right now in America and around the world, we're in the midst of a conversation about how do we really make equity and inclusion a sincere part of our society, right? Um, so I think that these stories are extremely helpful right now to tell the stories of civil rights icons, to um, tell the stories of the disenfranchised artist or or writer. You know, it's like bring them to the center of the subject matter, and then it educates audiences to be more empathetic because they can see something within themselves in the work, which is about one of these icons. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we're learning more and more all the time about mirror neurons, right? There is this element that we all have in our brains that, mm -hmm. like you were saying, see someone slumped over, understands that that's, I'm depressed because likely we've also experienced that in our lives or we're jumping up and down, that's elation. We understand that. And the mirror neurons are the thing that bridges that, that gap between you and I, right? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And I think that at least for me as, as a, someone who loves dance, sees all the time, that's what brings that goosebump on the skin, that tingle of, you know, when you see the lighting on the dancer and mm -hmm. just something that you feel it in your bones, there's that experience in the body and movement. And there's something in me that I understand and that's deeply affecting. Yeah, I think of it as this, it's like when you see dance, it creates this kinesthetic trigger, right? But then within that trigger of, of the body are stored um, mm. memories and histories and emotions. Mm. And those are released is how I feel. So if an individual 
has like an emotional response or has a um, just sort of like deep meditative response even to my work, you know, of deep contemplation, then I'm really happy and know that that piece of choreography is successful. I love it. I'm also curious about the way you create atmosphere mm -hmm. in your work. That's also something that's really struck me about your work is this atmospheric quality, like it becomes its own world, right? Mm -hmm. The way the lighting and the music and costuming comes together as this sort of container for what we think of as, as the art form, right? The movement, but you know, does overall include those things. I'm wondering about your process creating that atmosphere. Is it something that sort of evolves organically as you work with designers? Is it, you have this vision of what, what you want the atmosphere to be? Does that differ every time? I'm curious if you can speak mm. to that. Well, my process changes a little bit every time because I'm a singular choreographer for a, for a company that's been in existence a long time. So I wanna make sure that every piece is uniquely different mm -hmm. and yet recognizable. And so that's mm -hmm. always the balance, right? I want nice. somebody to be able to say like, oh, that's definitely Dana's work, but it's so different than the last one that I saw. Um, and so I think about this idea of atmosphere a lot. And I think about it um, because I, I believe it's because my parents were both visual artists. And so I grew up really looking at canvases being formed like over a series of weeks. And so when I look at the stage or I look at the dance unfolding in the studio, I'm very much looking at it like the studio or the stage is a canvas and the dancers are these um, brush strokes, right? Of oil or ink and, and so I know what images I want to frame and where I need to get to and then where I need to go. And so I often think of an image map and then I connect the maps together. Um, when I was a young dancer, I was asked by a woman named Eleanor King, who was one of the modern dance pioneers to um, go to her home and help her put together her archive so because she lived in Santa Fe. And so I went, I didn't know who she was. And she had spent a lot of time in Korea, actually. And she had studied shamanistic dance forms. And I remember having this early conversation with her um, that she believed that the dancer had the full capacity to cast a spell over the audience and take them to another world that mm -hmm. if they believed that they were in that world so strongly on stage that everybody would believe in that world. And um, I've always thought about that in coaching the dancers that there can never be a moment of fallout. Like they have to be all 100% invested in this world that we're creating. And it's that investiture of consciousness that I think a uh, audience picks up on right? Mm -hmm. they are, there's a spell cast over them and they, they're there for the journey until the curtain goes down. That's beautiful. Oh, thanks. That's yeah, beautiful. That's... <laughs> yeah and it, it, it translates, you know, that's definitely something like I was saying, I've seen in your work as, you know, every work, like you said, is something individual and you don't want to do the same thing over and over. That just uh -huh. gets extremely boring <laughs> um, <laughs> for, for you and for audiences, probably, I would say. Um, <laughs> But this through line of there is an atmosphere here. It's this, it's this little world unto itself and mm -hmm. casts a spell on the audience and they're there with the dancers. Right, yeah. Okay. <laughs> I also, I would love to hear more about your work all over the world, bringing, like you were saying before we were speaking, different projects in from the State Department and from the assignment from the State Department, Fulbright scholarships, all these different things you've done with yourself and with the company. Mm -hmm. And I'm curious about just from what you've seen, how the work translates and how it matters. You know, again, that through line through different cultures you've been to bringing movement. What is the sort of through line of the effect you've seen and 
I guess to back up, what what would be your elevator pitch, right? For someone being like, well, why should we spend money on dance diplomacy, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I think diplomacy for me is all about friendship building and it's about long-term friendship building. That's really the beginnings of diplomacy and maybe it's the core of it, right? And what better way to do that than to bring the gift of art and to <laughs> share personal stories with another audience and um, start a dialogue around that. And, you know, it's a non-confrontational dialogue. It's um, showing that we're all connected because of the universality of our stories, as we were saying. So um, that is fundamentally what I think of in terms of also having these exchanges through teaching and setting choreography abroad, you know, it's like you engage a whole community and that really amplifies throughout the community as well. Um, and I've had, I remember early on when I first started touring for the State Department, I was in Quito in Ecuador and we had taken this work called Tracings, which is a story actually about my um, Korean families coming to Hawaii in 1903 and becoming yeah. plantation workers. And they worked the, the pineapple fields and the sugar cane um, fields yeah. for generations. And my mother also you know, picked pineapples. And so I have this story and it's kind of like a seance in a way, like all these characters mm -hmm. come to life on stage and they come from the past and, um, and it really is about the hardships that they experience. It's about coming to a new land, not knowing what you're getting into and trying to figure out how to get ahead, how to survive and um, the harsh realities of the plantation. So in Quito, I thought, I had this sudden moment where I was like, oh my God, what am I doing? Why did I bring this piece of choreography? Is anyone going to get this? And, <laughs> after, and it was so wild because after we um, did the performance, our, our dressing room was inundated with people that like totally understood because they have a whole agricultural mm -hmm. society there and community. <laughs> and um, also like, you know, have pineapples, etc. So they totally got it. And the same thing when we went to Peru in this one city called Trujillo, um, people drove for up to three hours to come and see the American dance company to see modern dance. And what happened there was that there's a parallel immigration of Japanese to Peru who were agricultural yeah. workers that came at the same time period, the turn of the last century. And so everybody understood the story and associated it with one whole community there who had gone through the exact same plantation experience, but within a different country, right? Yeah. So, so there is this like universality as, we, as I keep saying this, these the shared stories that um, just communicate across um, languages, across um, political borders. Going back to you and your mission, that bridging of cultural divides mm -hmm. there in the, through the sharing of, of stories. Wow, full mm -hmm. circle. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Love it. Yeah, so sort of to wind down, Mm -hmm. I am curious about what your company or you personally might be doing next. What can our audience expect, support, look for? Oh, thanks. Yeah. <laughs> well, um, what we're doing this whole next season into next year is that we're putting together a social justice um, season. And so I'm creating works around, um, I just finished one of them about Cesar Chavez, who of course um, is a major Latinx you know, icon. And then um, we did a work last year about Marian Anderson, the opera singer, civil rights icon. And so we're making that into a video and we'll be presenting that through National Portrait Gallery. And then I'm doing some new works about um, Rosamund Johnson, who um, wrote Raise Every Vo Lift Every Voice, right? And um, 
Also, I'm doing a new work about Cesar Chavez and Dolores Huerta, who he worked with a lot. <laughs> and we're presenting a, a, a repertory piece called Island, which is about the Chinese immigration experience in the late 1800s to Angel Island. And what happened mm -hmm. was the Chinese exclusionary acts of the late 1800s caused people to get stuck in Angel Island, which is right by Alcatraz, actually, on the West Coast in the Bay of San Francisco. And it's one of my favorite pieces, actually. It, it happens with um, people are enclosed in a floor projection, which are archival images of individuals that went through Angel Island. And then there are four guards that march and interact with the individuals being housed there until they're released or not released. Um, and so it takes place in a 30 by 30 square, which is constantly environmentally changing because of an overhead video that shines down on it. And that's one of my favorite pieces. So I'm so glad that the National Portrait Gallery is um, asked to bring it back. And then um, I'm just starting a project that won't go up until 2022 um, that has to do with Maya Lin, the architect. So. I'm working a lot of um, different projects right now and I'm really excited about it. You know, there are some factors like our pandemic right now, which make the in-person full company experience more difficult, right? Because I teach class on Zoom, but we also have access to a studio that has um, hospital grade um, ventilation. So we're very lucky and I have two dancers that are quarantine together so I can work on duets and I can work on solos and then um, for the repertory piece individuals have to learn their parts you know at home but we're piecing it all together and so the beginning of our season of course is going to be the videos that are online and then we'll we're hoping to go live in May with Island and uh, so we're hoping and um, if not that'll also be a video Sounds pretty timely. Yeah. <laughs> You're describing island. Right. <laughs> we we right. know that story. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly, right? Yeah, totally. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah I, I feel like I'm seeing a lot of companies right now step up in that way. You mm -hmm. know, you scroll Instagram and everyone has a dancer make shape that says vote. And, you know, speaking mm -hmm. about these incredibly important issues, because mm -hmm. to me, the, the body is the most political thing <laughs> like that, that so many issues centered around our bodies and right where they go where they can't go the freedom they have or the freedom they don't have mm -hmm. um do you have health care or no you know it's so many things right and i mean that our bodies and mind like it's all together as one but the the political power of the body mm -hmm. i mean if you think of marching and assembly you know peaceful assembly in the streets like <laughs> absolutely and i think you know the body is so truthful, like the body right. doesn't lie, you know, right, and right. So it's not fake <laughs> news, it's like real news, right? <laughs> so right. I think that that's really in, in, important that we all, and I, you know, I think dance in general has always been an outcome of the um, political and social context in which it's <laughs> formed. And so I think that we're all, um, in this moment where we're trying to figure out how do we come to terms with what's going on? How do we best affect positive change through our work? And, um, and I think that we'll look back at this time period in 10 years from now and, and be quite amazed by the works that were created and, and hopefully by the change that they caused. Hmm. I think so. Just the, the innovation and the, the, I mean, dancers and choreographers are incredibly adoptable, right? Mm -hmm. That's that's what the name of the game is. Um, right. Just what I've seen so many artists do with film is so fascinating. Dance on film is by no means a new thing, but the way they're stepping up in this moment and being like, that's what I'm going to put the creative focus in is like, how can I make this fresh? And what am I interested in when I have mm -hmm. a dancer or dancers on film? Right. Something right. that's really, I've noticed that it's been fascinating to me. Well, yeah, I agree. I think that 
dance on film is such an important part of how people are surviving right now, right? Mm -hmm. And I guess what I wonder is, is it a placeholder until we get back to live performance? And mm -hmm. once we get out of quarantine, will people just be so hungry to get back to art and culture, which is live, that is interactive? And I'm hoping that people will, that I know that our new normal has probably changed forever, but right. I hope that what will come out of this is, is a new hunger for the arts. And what I worry the most about are our young dancers who are just entering the professional field or our professional dancers that are really at the height of their dancing careers right now, because to lose a year in a short time span of a career, right? A short career um, is just devastating. So um, sure. that's, yeah, so that's why we're trying to do as much as we can with our dancers, keep them working and um, do these video projects as well. Right. Okay. well. I'd intended to wind down, but that's always something else that triggers my brain, and fascinates me. Sure. Um, so yeah. Uh, if there's any last thing you want to say, um, please go ahead. Oh, gosh. Um, no, I just want to say it was such a pleasure to speak with you today. And um, yeah, I just always enjoy speaking with you about dance and about the creative process. And you have such a great insight in that, and I and enjoy your writing so much as well. So thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah. Always enjoyed your work and, and your unique eye. Oh, thank you. Well, stay safe and have a wonderful day. You too. Have Great. a good, good day, everyone. Remember to like, subscribe, comment, all that good stuff. We will see you next time. Thank, Thank you. you so much.